The House's October bill was a hit back in 2014 that ended on a cliffhanger. However, as the tagline on the poster teaser for the sequel reads, it was never an ending, it was an intermission. If you haven't seen my video on the original, you really should check it out before watching this. It'll bring you up to speed on the story of what the crew has gone through so far to make these films a reality. Anyway, The House's October Built was a fairly polarizing film. After it was released, there were some people who said it was their favorite Halloween movie ever, and others who flat out disliked it. It was an odd mix. Some praised the film for resisting the temptation to have someone die after 20 minutes like every modern horror film, as well as other people saying, What the hell was this movie? Nothing happens for an hour. One of the producers, Steven Schneider, who worked on the Paranormal Activity series, Insidious, and the upcoming Glass said, You want people to love it or hate it. The worst is if it's universally decided it's just okay. The House's October Built did very well, and the distributor, RLJ Entertainment, happily greenlit a sequel. The first film ended on a cliffhanger, and writer-director Bobby Rowe knew exactly where he wanted to go with part two. He had an outline with the structure of the sequel, and worked with his filmmaking partner, and co-star Zach Andrews to fill in all the details. They spent the next six months researching and writing the script for what would become The House's October Built 2. Much like the first film, they wrote the script in a way to leave it open for improv while filming. Since they'd be interviewing real people at the haunts, they wouldn't have it flexible, so they could react to what the person was saying accordingly. The script they had was 90 pages, with plenty of room for ad-libbing or improv, as long as they got in all the key story points. Since this was a direct continuation of the first, they wanted to make sure to get everyone back on board. Bobby Rowe, Zach Andrews, Mikey Rowe, and Jeff Larson. Brandy Schaefer was a tad hesitant because she was put through the ringer in the first film. Plus, they kept certain parts of the script away from her as a way to get a genuine surprise, which made her a little skeptical. However, the group are all friends in real life, so she knew they wouldn't do anything to put her in harm's way, unlike the characters they played in the film. The plot of the movie picked up right where the first one left off. Brandy was left on the side of the road after being buried alive for a brief time. The video of the event went viral, and she's become known to the world as Coffin Girl. It's getting close to October, and the group starts receiving offers to check out various haunts that the owners will pay them big bucks to visit, but only if they bring Coffin Girl. The problem is, Brandy's still recovering from the trauma, not surprisingly, and doesn't want anything to do with this. With her being the star, no Coffin Girl, no money. The group promises her nothing like what happened before will happen again, so once again they get in an RV and go to some amazing looking haunts across the country. In part one, the group explored the more standard haunted houses, so for part two, they wanted to include different experiences. Road been following the evolution of the haunt community and chose some of the most unique locations they could find for the sequel. They went scouting and found some of the biggest and best haunts they could across the country. Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia, PA, one of the most haunted places in the U.S. The infamous Soap Factory in St. Paul, Minnesota. A zombie 5K run in Perry, Georgia a 30,000-person zombie pub crawl in Minneapolis, Minnesota, plus some other cool haunts they found across the nation. They wanted to keep the Blue Skeletons as the villains, but didn't want to make them too obvious. They knew they had to disguise them, or Brandy's character would have instantly jumped on the next plane home. To do this, they wanted to come up with a word that would work with the title, so they searched through Webster's Dictionary. They found the word Hellbent, which besides being a perfect name for a haunted house, also was defined as determined to achieve something at all costs. To them, it felt like a word that embodied this entire franchise in front of and behind the camera. They played with the letters until serendipitously it spelled out something uncanny. With the letters mixed up, Seek Out Hellbent was an anagram for the Blue Skeleton. They figured out a way to incorporate this into the movie. While the interviews they had with people weren't scripted, they did have some of them say Seek Out Hellbent to give them a goal for the film. This was a way to steer the group towards the Blue Skeleton, while also keeping Brandy and the audience in the dark. The only place I know of is you want to seek out Hellbent. They want to increase the scope of the series to make it bigger and prettier than the original. This would also play into a reveal for much later in the movie. Even though the scope of the sequel was larger, they had a budget that was on par with part one. Although after essentially shooting the original film twice, they really knew how to stretch a budget. While yes, these movies are horror films, at the core they're more adventures that revolve around Halloween. They aren't slashers or traditional found footage films. The best way to describe them would be horror homages to David Fincher's The Game. The tagline for The Game is, What do you get the man who has everything? Since these films are aimed specifically at horror fans, they made these films as, How do you scare someone who isn't scared of anything? Haunts have been up in the ante over the years to scare people, but at what cost? As Patrick Swayze said in Point Break, You want the ultimate, you gotta be willing to pay the ultimate price.
Well, that price is manufactured murder. Can you handle it? They were looking further into the psychology of fear and contacted Dr. Margie Kerr, who wrote the book Scream, Chilling Adventures in the Science of Fear. She's one of the few people in the world who have a PhD in fear. She consulted with the group and was a fan of the original movie, so she gladly signed on to be in the sequel. They planned to interview her at Eastern State. In the first film, all the way back in 2011, Brandy dyed her hair black. After they shot the film for the first time, she cut her hair short. When the studio wanted them to reboot the film, mixing footage from the original, along with new footage, they had to spend thousands of dollars getting believable hair extensions that matched her hair from what they had already shot. There was a segment in the film they had to cut entirely because they used a thermal filter, which picked up the dead hair and was incredibly distracting. After they reshot the film, she knew they weren't going to be filming for a while, and asked if she could go back to her natural hair color. Blonde. They ended up using this as a hook for the sequel. After the events of Part 1, Brandy went into hiding and changed her hair color so people wouldn't recognize her. For the grand finale, they needed a location for the Hellbent facility. They searched for over a year trying to find a location that would fit what they had in the script, but came up with nothing. One day while on vacation with his family, Bobby Rowe stumbled upon the perfect spot. His daughter was obsessed with Pete's dragon, and he was taking her to a lighthouse to pretend to meet Elliot and Nora. They went to one in Port Townsend, and noticed about a quarter mile from there was an old battery from World War II. The location was perfect. He looked into it to find it's been abandoned, and they haven't shot anything there since an officer and a gentleman all the way back in 1982. They got a permit to film there and had their finale house. It was better than they ever could have dreamed. With everything in place, they started filming. It was going to be a long shoot because they needed to film over two Halloweens. The crew from the original was mostly back, but they scaled it down so it wasn't quite as big. Unfortunately, Andrew Strayhorn, the DOP on Part 1, wasn't available for the entire shoot because he was hired as the head DP on the Lethal Weapon TV series. After the season wrapped, he was able to come in and shoot a few sequences for Part 2. Since Strayhorn wouldn't be available for most of the shoot, they hired Ricardo Sanchez to take over the cinematography. They had their locations lined up and traveled to each of them to film. The footage in the beginning of the movie was Bobby and Zack at the ScareCon in London, where they were talking to haunt owners in the UK. As a way to make the sequel more dynamic, they shot some footage with a drone. They felt this fit in well with the group and didn't feel that far outside the realm of what these characters would be doing. Naturally, they'd want to increase the quality of their documentary, and getting some aerial shots would most likely do that. The first film was such a hit with the haunt community, they had a problem with anonymity this time around. They'd be filming and numerous people would recognize them. This was both a positive and a negative. Positive because the movie was a mirror of reality, and negative because they couldn't get away with as much as they could before. They had a girl dressed in the porcelain costume, and fans were taking her picture to put on social media. They hadn't announced the sequel yet, so they ended up having to hide her. Since they were trying to keep it a secret, they gave some fans movie posters in exchange for them taking down their Instagram shots of the production. Apparently, porcelain's hidden in each of the different haunts in the movie as sort of a Where's Waldo horror edition. The Zombie Pub Crawl was an annual event in Minnesota that was in the Guinness Book of World's Records for the largest zombie event. 30,000 people in zombie costumes. They wanted to film the event and have it end with a brain-eating contest. They thought it would be great if they could do it with the world champion of eating competitions, Kobayashi. The only problem was they'd been trying repeatedly to get a hold of him with absolutely no luck. It was getting close to filming and they had contingencies in place in case they couldn't get him for the shoot. The guys went to Minnesota early and stopped in a pub to have a few beers. While they were there, Mikey started flirting with a waitress and discovered she was a fan of the first movie. They told her they were there to film the event for the sequel and were planning on getting their asses kicked by the greatest eater on the planet. She said, Oh, you mean Kobe? He's over there having dinner. Just a few tables away from them was the guy they had been trying to get a hold of for months. What are the odds? Mikey went over, introduced himself, and then called over the rest of the group. Turns out Kobayashi always wanted to be in a horror movie and would gladly do it. At the event, they did eat real, slightly grilled brains for the crowd. It was about as awful as you can imagine, and the group throwing up afterwards wasn't staged. The Zombie 5K was an amazing location. It's a million-square-foot facility in Perry, Georgia, where firemen, police, and the military do training exercises all year for things like school shootings, hurricanes, evacuations, and subway wrecks. However, one day a year, they redress the location with lots of references to things like Resident Evil, and they do a full-scale zombie 5K run. It truly is a sight to behold. While filming the Hellbent sequence, they were the only people there aside from some campers nearby. The next morning, they got an angry voicemail from one of the forest rangers. The campers were complaining to them, not about the chainsaws, the screaming, or the fires. They were upset because the generators were too loud. They shot many of the haunt scenes with the Sony A7S II. 
The camera's ISO opens up so much you can almost see in the dark without having to use night vision. This came in very handy since almost the entire film was shot at night. They had a few homages in the film. The opening was an homage to Hocus Pocus. The scene when they find out Matt Dunn, the owner of Screamtown, is also a magician, is a nod to when Michael Douglas realizes one of the guys at CRS is an actor in the game. They found out musician Marilyn Manson was a big fan of the first movie, so they thought it would be appropriate to use his quote for the sequel. In the graffiti room scene, they're drinking his man-synth absinthe in his honor. While working on the film, they compared the group to the Scooby Gang. After shooting the gassing scene, they found a clip from Scooby-Doo where the gang, on their way to a haunted house, gets gassed in a similar but less graphic fashion. They wanted to license the clip for the film, but the cost to license it was way out of their budget, so they had to pass. For the opening, the Skull Man's played by the same actor who played the final Skull Man in the original documentary back in 2011. To make them as imposing as possible, many of the members of the Blue Skeleton were ex-MLB and NFL players. Dutch Bahari from Skin Wars did the makeup along with Jackie O'Lantern of Instagram fame. It was the night of the hellbent death scenes when tragedy struck. Their special effects supervisor had a death in the family and had to leave. They couldn't afford to move the shoot date because of their deadline, so the remaining cast and crew all banded together to make them happen as best they could. They made their own blood and even were waterboarded, well, bloodboarded for real. They shot a clean version of the reveal at the end, which showed everything the Blue Skeleton had been planning for them since the ending of Part 1. They even had a small-scale model of Hellbent for the guys to devise their plan. For the film, they were able to get the only 8-foot chainsaw in the world on loan from a private maker in Oregon. The sequel wasn't exactly found footage. It had obviously been produced with titles, a soundtrack, and shots of the Blue Skeleton following them. Although, it's not revealed until the end what it really is. So while the first movie could be called found footage, the sequel veered more into being a mockumentary. After filming on and off for over two years, they moved into post. They brought back Cesar Martinez to edit the sequel. Martinez is best known for editing the Unsolved Mysteries TV series, and his style perfectly suited the look they wanted. The postwork on the film was time-consuming, and the deadline to get a cut to the studio was quickly approaching. The last thing they needed was the audio mix. It was the night before the delivery date, and the head of sound, Steve Yeaman, has a mild heart attack. They get a call from his doctor telling them what happened, and that he needed to stay in the hospital overnight for observation. Rowe told the doctor to tell Steve he understood, and would notify the studio. In the background, he could hear Steve saying, I have a movie to finish! Without anyone knowing, Yeaman snuck out of the hospital to finish the movie and then checked himself back in the next day. Rose said that kind of passion and devotion is why they work with the same people time and time again. With the film finished, they were looking at a release date. They were asked to premiere the film at the Telluride Horror Show like last time, but unfortunately their release date didn't line up. They released the film in September of 2017 to give it more time before Halloween. All the horror festivals were in October, so they missed their window this time around. Although it did screen at the Halloween International Film Festival, and the Horror Ant Film Festival in Athens, Greece, where it was nominated for Best Picture. They held the premiere at the Silent Movie Theater in Los Angeles, a well-known haunted theater. There are numerous stories of the place being haunted, and the show Ghost Adventures investigated there. To promote the film, they released a soundtrack called The Music October Built, which included a dark reimagining of the jazz hit Halloween Spooks. They shot a music video for the song at the Dead End Hayride. They also created a VR 360 segment of the gravesite as further promotion. This was released on the horror-centric website Bloody Disgusting. The sequel was featured in Scream Magazine and even Entertainment Weekly. Actor Kevin Pollack was a big fan of the first movie and had Mikey and Bobby on his talk show to talk about the sequel. Zack and Bobby were on Adam Green and Joe Lynch's Movie Crypt podcast. On New Year's Eve 2017, Kobayashi showed clips of the movie on the Japanese version of Dick Clark's Rock and Eve. He was then in an eating contest with a full-grown male lion. The reception for the sequel was like the first movie polarizing. Some wanted more of what the film wasn't. They wanted more gore, more malevolence, more spite, but that isn't what these movies are about. Other folks got the spirit of what the film was going for and loved it for being different. The House's October Built 2 was retitled for the UK release as The Blue Skeleton. Both movies are also being released for the first time in Japan. The House's October Built 2 was a success and the group's going to continue with Part 3. They said 1 and 2 were the origin story and 3 would go in another unexpected direction. They did shoot an after credits stinger that would lead into part 3, but they didn't feel the tone was right after the dark ending, so they cut it. Before getting into part 3, the group decided to take a breather and do a few other things first. Bobby and Zack wanted to do something outside of horror for a change, so they wrote a children's book, Nara and the Unicorn, the original Narwhal story, which was released in 2018 and is currently up for a few awards. 
I have a copy myself, and I must say, it is a heartwarming little tale. Beyond that, Bobby and Zach are writing a script for the producers of The Walking Dead, a grounded horror feature that will hopefully be the start of a new macabre universe. The House's October Built series continue to have a life beyond the films. They recently inspired a line of t-shirts from Terror Threads. The House's October Built 2 Hellbent is a movie that exceeded my expectations. As I said when I reviewed them, I'm not a big fan of found footage because most of them are incredibly lazy. These two movies are most certainly not. In part one, they use the found footage angle to draw you into the film to make you feel like you're involved, and in part two, it feels more like watching a mystery unfold rather than a jump scare filled cliche fest. This is one of the few sequels that manages to get you to look at the first film differently. You get to see how the Blue Skeleton Group is more than just a gang of nutbags that get off on terrifying people. They're a well-organized, well-funded group of people with ties all over the world. They're trying to get their message out there. What is that message? Seek out Hellbent for yourself. <laughs> drinking a drone? Drinking a drone, bro. It's a little unsafe. Good. Is this really going to put hair on my chest? No, nothing will. <laughs> <laughs>